Let's take a look at a guided implant surgery case where a patient presented with tooth number 31, which was missing for a long time. And uh, asking the patient how long it was missing, he stated it was uh, many years. So I took the patient through a cone beam CT scan, obviously a comprehensive exam, and I wanted to fabricate a guide for a guided surgery. This guide was fabricated based on a intraoral scan and a cone beam CT scan. And uh, once we fabricated it, I was able to go ahead and seat it on top of uh, the adjacent teeth. This is what we call a tooth supported guide. And I was able to go through the protocol of creating the osteotomy. So initially, I want to go ahead and uh, remove the soft tissue. So I'll use a tissue punch. And once I have access to uh, the surface of the bone, I'll go ahead and go through my osteotomy drills with this system. We're using a spoon and a, and a sleeve uh, to guide each one of our drills. So we'll go step by step in order to create the osteotomy. So each one of these steps is uh, very important because each drill is in order and you want to go through each one of these uh, drills within that order in, in terms of uh, creating the osteotomy so you can have a very nice and, uh, and clean site to place your implant. So step by step, we'll go through our, our pilot drill and uh, eventually widen and deepen the osteotomy to the point where we can go ahead and deliver the implant. Uh, in this scenario, I went ahead and utilized a uh, Han implant to uh, place uh, for our patient. And once uh, the osteotomy is created, I can actually go ahead and connect the implant to what's called an implant mount. The implant mount allows us to deliver the implant through the surgical guide. So there's a, a step where we go ahead and connect the implant mount to the implant, and then we can go ahead and place that through the guide. Now you can either use a hand driver to uh, place the implant, which I'm doing in this situation, or you can use your implant motor, and also uh, you can uh, utilize that to place the implant. So a couple of different techniques. Uh, it's really uh, with the uh, preference. I like to use a torque wrench uh, to place the implant because Sometimes if uh, the osteotomy site is, if the bone quality is a little bit denser, I like to be able to back out and repeat and replace my implant several times in and out of the osteotomy site until I get it to the proper depth. So here we get a picture of the implant in position. And uh, once the implant is in the correct position, I'll go ahead and place a healing abutment. Uh, healing abutments come in different heights. So uh, usually I like to measure the tissue and I select the implant height based on uh, how much soft tissue I have and uh, where I want that soft tissue to end. So here you get a nice picture of the radiograph with the implant and the uh, healing abutment in place. And uh, the patient goes through a period of osteointegration, integration, and usually four months. And in this situation, it was four months. And once the implant is fully integrated into the bone, I'll go ahead and remove the healing abutment and place the impression coping. We're taking a traditional impression. We also have uh, the option of placing a implant scan abutment to be able to scan the implant and also the adjacent teeth for a final impression. This method here, we're utilizing the traditional medium body for the implant and the soft tissue and the adjacent teeth a little bit. And then I'll go ahead and pick everything up with uh, heavy body impression material. This impression material, material will set and within a few minutes I can go ahead and remove it and I'll check and make sure that I captured all the uh, vital structures and then I can go ahead and get an impression of the uh, maxillary arch and a bite registration and uh, send that to the laboratory for fabrication of a final restoration. So I have all the information sent to the lab and the lab will fabricate a final restoration. In this situation, it is a screw retained Bruxer crown. And I'll go ahead in the next visit and remove the healing abutment once again and seat the implant crown. And uh, just like the delivery of any other crown, I want to check my mesial and distal contacts. And I also want to check my opposing with the implant crown. When it's screw retained, I'll go ahead and torque the uh, final delivery screw to uh, 35 newton centimeters. And, and then deliver the, uh, the final restoration with some Teflon and, and some composite. So everything is uh, sealed up 
and then I'll go through and I'll check the occlusion one more time after my assistant cures uh, the composite on top of the implant. So here we have a nice uh, before and after picture with the guided uh, surgical protocol and delivery of the final restoration. And in this situation, unfortunately, we have a patient who came in with uh, an implant in the area of tooth number 30. And as you can see here, the implant was placed very well. And the patient had a stock healing abutment with a cementable crown. And in this situation, unfortunately, it seems that there was some cement extrusion. And that's probably why this uh, implant ended up having so much bone loss. And as you can see in this picture, there is the ring of cement that you can see at the junction of the stock healing abutment and the final restoration. So uh, the procedure was pretty straightforward for me. I had to go in and actually remove the implant and provide the patient with a little bit of bone graft in the area. Once the implant was removed, I moved forward with the bone graft. I went ahead and opened a flap, uh, placed uh, bone graft material in this situation, again, uh, some bio -os, and let the patient heal for about four months. So uh, at the four month period, as you can see the, the progression of the healing, I brought the patient back in for uh, the implant placement visit. A uh, flap was created in the, in the site and you can see that the bone had healed and the patient could receive a new implant. So I went ahead and moved forward with creating my uh, osteotomy for this implant. The implant that I am replacing the previous implant with is, uh, is the Han implant. Uh, utilizing a cone beam CT scan, I was able to measure the exact size of the implant that I wanted to utilize. So I'll make my initial osteotomy and I'll use my parallel pins to make sure that I'm in the right direction and the right angulation. And once that's confirmed with the radiograph, I'll go ahead and finish creating my osteotomy completely with different size osteotomy drills moving up in size, essentially. And once the osteotomy is fully created, you can appreciate uh, the occlusal view of the osteotomy. I'll go ahead and place the implant. So the implant is placed and usually I like to look for a higher torque value uh, to determine the stability of the implant. The implant is in place. I'll go ahead and place a healing abutment and then I will suture the tissue around the implant and the, and the healing abutment. And uh, again essentially I'll go through a period and I'll wait about three to four months before bringing the patient back in for a final impression. So uh, two interrupted sutures are in place and I'll go ahead and try to create primary closure as best as I can in this situation to help with the healing and again a series of uh, occlusal pictures shows you the healing process over time and once the implant has gone through a period of osteointegration I'll bring the patient back and remove the healing cap or healing abutment and I'll seat the impression coping and again at this stage I'll have my assistant take a radiograph to confirm that the impression coping is seated properly and hopefully it is and I'll go ahead and move forward with the final impression. Usually I like to utilize a medium body polyvinyl siloxane material and then pick that up with a heavy body. The reason I don't like to use light body again is because of the movement of the uh, impression coping and the implant analog within the impression. So I want to make sure that I have a more solid material, stronger material to hold on to the impression coping. So once I send that to uh, the laboratory, in this situation I prescribed a Bruxer anterior actually. So this material is the Bruxer anterior block uh, and it was milled right here at Glidewell Dental Laboratories. And it is strong enough for a posterior uh, restoration with the flexural strength of between 650 to 800 megapascals. So I was comfortable creating a, uh, fabricating a final crown with the material and I went ahead and torqued the restoration into place and placed Teflon and composite. And I'll go ahead and check the occlusion and make sure that I have the crown out of occlusion slightly. So there you can appreciate the occlusal and buccal view of the restoration and the final radiograph of the implant in place. If you'd like more information on the Han implant, please visit our website. And there is a lot of educational information on the implant and the utilization of different dental materials such as the Bruxer anterior restoration.